Please stand with me as I read from God's Word, beginning in Luke chapter 12 and verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this um, this encouragement in your word and from the lips of our Savior himself to trust you. Um, I have no doubt, Father, that there are all kinds of burdens represented here today among us, uh, most of which need to be laid at your feet and left there with the uh, simple trust that you are doing the work in life that we cannot do. And so would you give us insight into this word as we try to examine it and unpack it a little bit this morning. We pray, Father, we pray for those who are in hard places today. We pray for our missionaries. Lord, I think of, uh, um, I think of, of even some uh, that Jesse talked about, some of the translators, three of them that are translating the Bible in various places using his unfolding word project. And three of them have been just in the last week, jailed, one of them a young woman. And they're paying a heavy price of torture and, and, and imprisonment for their faith. We understand the young lady will be released, but to her brother who is promised to imprison her in his basement. Lord, we live in a bubble. We don't understand. Think of Wayne Losey, who is going, uh, has gone this week with his daughter, Rebecca, to Asia, to the place where they minister there. Think of how we heard just a week ago one of the believers that had come to Christ there has been killed for his faith. We live in a bubble. We don't understand. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us to see what we have such a hard time seeing because we live in such a privileged place. To understand what it means to stand for Christ, what it means to be a true Christian, a true follower of Christ, someone who would give our life for the sake of and the name of our Savior. We pray for those who are working in these kinds of places. Lord, we ask that you will, number one, that you will assure them that there are those who are praying for them and who care about them. And we pray, secondly, that you will protect them. We pray that their enemies, Father, will come to faith in Christ, that the testimony that comes from their lips and from their life will bear rich fruit. Our troubles seem so small, Father, really, by comparison. Give us perspective. Give us wisdom. Most of all, help us, Father, as we understand your word, then to live it out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And if you haven't already, please turn to uh, Luke chapter 12 uh, as we continue today, the second of, the, uh, of three what will be three sermons on this uh, passage through verse 31. Why not worry? Why not worry? Worry and anxiety are kind of a constant in life, aren't they? I mean, if you live, you probably worry. You probably have anxiety. And to some extent, that's going to be true of all of us. We live on some scale, somewhere between, you know, zero and 100. There we all are. Obviously, the goal is to be as close to zero as possible. Perhaps if you need a cure for anxiety, you might try the psychic hotline. If you went to the psychic hotline, you might find a message something like this. Welcome to the psychic hotline. If you are obsessive compulsive, please press one repeatedly. If you are codependent, please ask someone else to press. If you have multiple personalities, please press three, four, five, and six. If you are paranoid, delusional, we know who you are and what you want. Just stay on the line so we can trace the call. If you are schizophrenic, 
Listen carefully, and a little voice will tell you which number to press. If you are depressed, it doesn't matter which number you press. No one will answer. I think most of us have felt that way at some point in time, right? Why is no one answering? I'm, 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 I'm talking to the Lord, but I don't seem to be getting any answer, and I'm worried. Well, Jesus has a response to worry and to anxiety. It's, a, it's an answer that you wouldn't expect. I mean, the heart of it, the heart of it is in verse 31 in this passage, where he says, instead, seek his kingdom. And then these things will all be added to you. In other words, make him first. Make him first. Worry diminishes God, as we saw last week. Faith enlarges God. The more our worry, the smaller God. The more our bigger our God is, the smaller our worry. And so Jesus' answer to worry is get over yourself and get on with God's agenda. That's where your attention needs to be focused. That's where your life needs to be lived. That's what should be central. A lot of the worry would go away if that were the case. When we do and are following what the Lord is prescribing, worry kind of has to leave the building because we know he's in charge. We realize he is actually in charge. Now, if we don't do that, however, what the Lord has done in this passage is give us seven bad things that are going to happen. Seven things as a result of worry that are going to be there. And he's doing this to give us the incentive to trust him. So we've been looking at those. We looked at the first two last week. We'll take two more today and then finish up next week. But the first one we looked at is that worry destroys God's peace. It destroys God's peace. In verse 22, do not be anxious about your life. We saw that the word anxious means to be distracted, to be pulled apart, to be focused in multiple directions all at the same time. Someone's mind is just here, there, and everywhere because there's something to worry about everywhere they look. And what Jesus is saying is stop looking at all the circumstances and all the things and being distracted and look in one place. Look to me. The writer of Hebrews said it that way, right? It said, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our salvation. That's where our attention needs to be. And when it's not, we're going to be Worried, so we need to get focused on one place at Him and then leave the Lord, leave the worry to the Lordship of Jesus. I think we think that every wrong is a sign that something is going wrong, and the fact is, everything that comes into our life is under the hands of a loving Father for some purpose. We will only see that if we're looking to Him. Second thing, worry does it defies God's perspective. Verse 23, here's God's perspective. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. That is not our perspective. Our perspective is life is all about food and all about clothing. It's all about things that we see, touch, feel, taste, and smell. Whatever we can see with our senses, that's what we know. And everything in our mind says that's what real life is about. So survival is the greatest good. I've got to do everything I can to survive. What Jesus is saying is, no, it's not right. Survival is not the name of the game. The kingdom of God is the name of the game. Whatever God desires is the name of the game. If we were to even lose our life in pursuit of the kingdom of God, we would have the greater privilege of being in the presence of God. And Jesus has an eternal perspective that we do not have, and so he's asking us, seek the kingdom of God, the rest will take care of itself. So let's look at the third thing now, verse 24 and then 27 and 28. Worry devalues God's provisions. Worry devalues God's provisions. In other words, here's a way to think of this. Worry looks around at the things that I have that God has provided for me and says it's not enough. I'm missing something. I don't have everything that I ought to have. Worry not only diminishes God's person, it devalues God's provisions. Worry says, whatever God has provided is not enough, and I don't trust him for what I need. Therefore, I will worry it into existence. Good luck. But that's what we do. 
because worry devalues the provisions that God has already given. Beloved, if God's promises are true, then think of it this way. Worry is, you know, it's a waste of time at best. It's an insult to God at worst. Right? Because it's basically saying in my mind, God isn't being faithful here. God's not taking care of me. Remember what he says in verse 22, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what, what you will put on. In other words, don't even worry about the basics. If you don't worry about the basics, you sure don't need to worry about the luxuries, right? He's saying God will take care of those. So work for what you will eat and what you will wear, but don't worry about them. Don't let that become the focus of your whole attention. The things of this life, that's the command. Now Jesus gives two examples here that are intended to show us that his provision is indeed adequate, that we are unfaithful when we are devaluing what he provides. The first one concerns food in verse 24. He says, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? That's interesting that Jesus chooses ravens here. Ravens, some of the most despised birds on earth. In those days, they were considered unclean by men and declared unclean by God in his law. And yet God says with no means whatsoever to provide for themselves, they can't plant, they can't harvest, they can't store it up, yet they have plenty of food. I take care of the despised ravens. And if I do that for them, what do you think I will do for you, my eternal beings, my creation? Do you think I would possibly let you go without? Jesus is saying, I will take care of you. I will feed you. I will make sure that you have what you need if you put me first. Now you say, well, you know what? I know of some raisins that have died of famine. In fact, I know of some people that have died of famine. I even know of some believers that have died of hunger and famine. And indeed, some have, right? Does that mean that the promise is null and void? Does that mean that God has failed? Well, we must never think that, right? God never fails. His promises never fail. It simply means that for some greater kingdom good that we can't see and can't understand right now, God has chosen to dry up the resources. But see, this is all still in keeping with that first principle. Life is more than food. So when famine comes, it's an aberration, but it can happen. But even then, we still have the promise of Romans 8, verse 35, where Jesus says this. God says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine even if famine were to come, even if we're doing what we can to make a living, to have the food that we need and that we need to supply our family with, and yet God for some reason sees fit not to supply it, but we're still seeking his kingdom, even if that happened, would we lose the love of Christ? And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You would still have the greater good. You would still have the promise of heaven. You would still have eternity secured. You would have everything you ever need eternally. God will provide. Life is more than food. To meet his greater goods, God does sometimes withhold food. He does sometimes withhold certain things that are physical needs, but not most of the time. There's a little poem that kind of illustrates this. It goes like this. It says, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so, said the sparrow to the robin. Friend, I think it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. But we've got to realize God is on the lookout for us. Worry devalues God's provision in my life. 
Now, verses 27 and 28 make the same point with regard to clothing, right? 27, he says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. They're more beautiful than anything you could ever make. But if God so clothes even the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Trust God. This isn't hard to understand, is it? Jesus is saying, look at the flowers. Look how beautiful they are. Look how I've taken care of them. They're more beautiful than anything you could possibly make from a human perspective. And that's all a result of me. Even the grass, which you love to look at, and you look out at that green grass on the golf course or out in the park somewhere, and you enjoy the green grass, and the green grass is going to be there, you know, until next week when the lawnmower comes through and cuts it, right? And then it goes to the dump where it gets burned up in the oven, as he's talking about here, maybe used for fuel in this case, and yet God made that grass to be beautiful in its time. And he's saying, will I not for my eternal created beings provide for your needs? Yes. The answer is, isn't do I have all of the food I want in all of the latest fashion? question is, do I have enough food and clothing to fulfill the mission that God has for my life? That's the question. The problem is so many times we don't quite get to that question. God will make sure we have everything. You say, well, if I have nothing, then beloved, that's what God intends for the purpose of your life. Submission to God, trust in God, love for God because he loves us. You know, there's one thing that the ravens, the lilies, and the grass, they all have in common. You know what that is? They're all fulfilling the will of God. They're all doing what God made them to do. They're accomplishing the purpose that God put them on earth for. Now, you could look at that and say, well, yeah, but they don't have any choice. Right. That's Jesus' point. They don't have a choice. We do. And what Jesus is saying is, why don't you do the same thing? You accomplish the, and fulfill the purpose God's put you on earth for. I'll take care of the rest of it. But you get focused on me. You put your trust in me. You put your faith in me. And watch what I will do. I tell you, when you see people who really live by faith, you see some amazing things, beloved. It may, not, it may not be, you know, Oysters Rockefeller and, uh, you know, clams on the half shell or whatever it is that you love. It may not be that, but it'll be what you need to accomplish God's will in your life. It may not be designer jeans and Gucci handbags, but it'll be what you need. And it'll be what I need to accomplish the purpose that God has put me here for. So Jesus is saying, trust in him. Seek his kingdom. Seek the things that he wants. Seek to accomplish his purposes. That's what it means to seek his kingdom. Let him be the ruler in your life, not you. And he'll fill in the rest of it. Let me show you what happens when we get uh, distracted. Turn with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. There's a, um, the, first, the first 12 chapters or so of First Kings are the story of King Solomon. And the way the story's presented in First Kings 1 through 12 is very characteristic of a Hebrew literary style. It's called a, a chias, chiastic, C-H-I-A-S-T-I-C, chiastic form of, of style that's used here. And the way that works is this. Normally in English, we, when we're presenting something, we're writing something, we're putting a story together, whatever, we drive to a climax that comes at the end of the story, right? But oftentimes, in Hebrew, it uses this chiastic style which drives to a conclusion in the middle of the story. 
And it does this, it does this by having sort of bookends that progressively work toward the middle. So the first part corresponds in some way to the last part. And the second part in some way corresponds to the next to the last part. And it all builds to a climax in the middle. And that's what we see in 1 Kings 1 through 12. So for example, in 1 Kings 1, we see Solomon receiving the kingdom from his father, David. And so that's pretty much the subject matter of chapter 1. When you go to chapter 12, you see Solomon and his, actually his son Rehoboam losing the kingdom to Jeroboam, and the whole kingdom of Israel splits into two at that point. In chapter, go back to chapters 2 and 3 in 1 Kings, and you find uh, that there's emphasis there on Solomon's um, wisdom and his literary gifts, and how God had given those to him to use for God's glory. You get to chapter 10, and you see how Solomon's wisdom is misused for his own selfish ends, for his own splendor, for his own glory. And so you have these corresponding bookends. You get to chapters, chapters kind of uh, five and six, and you see Solomon building the shell of the temple that God has equipped him to build and given him the money and the special privilege to do. But he never quite gets done with the inside, the utensils, and all of the inside isn't completed yet. So you go to chapter seven, verse 15 through chapter 9, verse 9, and you see Solomon completing that with all the utensils and so on. And so the, you have these bookends. But what's the climax right in the middle? What's the main point of these 12 chapters? Because it comes in the middle. The climax is this. In the middle, Solomon interrupts his building of the temple to do something else, which is to build his own house. And so, look with me at chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. Skip down to verse 7. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to pronounce judgment, even the hall of judgment. It, is, it was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken in marriage. So what we have here is a picture of Solomon in the middle of building God's house he gets defocused, and his focus now becomes on his own house, which is further emphasized, by the way, by the fact that it took him seven years to build the magnificent temple that he built, which was a magnificent temple. It took him 13 years to build his own house, so imagine what that looked like. Almost double the time. What happened? Solomon lost sight of God. He left his first love. His first love became something else, and we have the hint of it there that Pharaoh's daughter was one that he had taken in marriage. So what happens is all that was built up in the first six chapters of First Kings comes unraveled in the last six chapters, or in the next six chapters of First Kings because of the failure of Solomon in the middle to keep God in the center of his life. But simply, he got worried about food and clothing, and he lost sight of God's kingdom. He devalued God's provision. He devalued God's provision in, 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 in many ways, but I suppose the most prominent way would be that, that God had provided. He said, I, I don't want the kings of Israel to have many horses, and I don't want them to have many wives. I don't know what part of that Solomon didn't understand, but he ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. Uh, that, that's one woman a night for three years running, beloved. Think about it. No wonder his heart was turned away from God, right? He lost sight of what he was about. 
Dr. Jekyll became Mr. Hyde. He devalued God's provision, which required that a king not have all of these, all of these wives and attention focused in all of these other areas. Did that make him an unbeliever? No. But it made him unproductive, unfruitful, unfaithful, and unhappy. He didn't have a worry-free day from the time he took the first wife. You can read Ecclesiastes if you don't think that's true. We get defocused. We believe that what God has given us isn't sufficient. Beloved, we must trust that God is doing what is absolutely best for us and what will most glorify Him. We have to do that. If we don't do that, worry will eat us alive. Worry will eat us alive. Even the things, now listen carefully to this, even the things that come into your life as a result of your own sin, and you can see that. Now, if you keep sinning, you get what you deserve. But if you're repentant, and you can see that there are things going on there because of your sin, quit worrying about it. God will take care of that. He does. He works through our failures. Thank God. Professor uh, Bruce Walkie, I think he was a, at Dallas Seminary at the time, he, he was preaching at a church. He, he preached at a church while he taught there it's in, the, in the 1990s. But the stock market, some of you re remember, uh, the stock market was going crazy in the middle to late 90s, right? Every, it, was one of, it was almost like the 20s all over again, you know, where, where shoeshine boys were giving tips to the people that were coming by what to buy because people were getting rich overnight, and so what happened in this church is several of the elders, several of the leaders of this church said, we need to take a leave of absence from our leadership in the church because we need to concentrate on the stock market while it's going nuts so we can make money. And so they went off to do that. One of them didn't. He said this because Walkie had been teaching on 1 Kings 1 through 12, and he had seen what happened in the life of Solomon, and that particular elder said this. He said, I was thinking of resigning too until I saw what happened to Solomon in this passage. And I decided I was not going to put my portfolio ahead of God. That was a good decision. Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, that saved him a lot of anxiety and worry beginning about 1998. Probably saved him a lot of money too. We must accept what God gives us, beloved. Not that if we can work for something more, it's not that we don't have ambition, it's not that it's not right to seek what God will give, but we must be content with what God gives as we do what he asks us to do. And make sure that our seeking is toward his kingdom, not toward our own. Fourth thing, back in Luke 12, that I see here that Jesus warns is that worry denies God's providence. Worry denies God's providence. Okay, in our men's group on Thursday morning, and if you're not there, you need to be 6.30 every other Thursday. Come and join us. Uh, we're studying providence of God in the life of Joseph right at the moment. It's a great study. What is providence? Providence is God working through the everyday events of your life and my life to bring about His will. Providence. It's God working miraculously, but not through supernatural means, just through natural means. And according to the Bible, everything that happens in the life of a true believer is for God's glory and our good. Everything. But we don't believe that. And Jesus' point here is, when you don't believe that, you're going to be worried. You're going to be anxious. Your anxiety will cause you to deny the providence of God. It will, it, will, it will cause you to miss the sign that's over your life that says, God at work. Cause you to deny that. It will cause you to think that you can control the uncontrollable. 
Most anxiety is caused by that, a desire to control the uncontrollable. And when we can't, we worry about it with this kind of false thing in the back of our mind, if I just worry enough, it'll fix itself. Of course, it won't. But we worry. So it tries to control the uncontrollable. Anxiety is a denial of God's providential working in my life. Look at verse 25. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Now, the translators in the ESV have chosen to translate add a single hour to the span of his life. The language there isn't clear. It could be add a single hour or it could be add a single inch to your height. It's not clear. I've looked at every Greek book I can find, every commentary I can find, and nobody knows for sure which it means. But either way, the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? This either one is something you can't control. I can't control. I am as tall as I am because God made me that way at the end of the day, and so are you. I will live as long as God has already predetermined that I will live, and so will you. We can't, by worry, add an hour to our life or add an inch to our height. It's not possible. Now, we can do certain things health-wise that from a human perspective would add days to our life. You eat healthy and you exercise and so on, and anyone can tell you you will probably live longer on average. But the point is, God's already predetermined how long you're going to live. And you can't, by worry, add an hour to your life. You can worry yourself to death, but you can't worry yourself to life, right? Neither can you add an inch to your height, although it doesn't stop some people from trying. I had a guy who worked for me one day, called me into his office, and he asked me to sit down. That was a little unusual, but I sat down, and he said, do you notice anything? And I, said, I looked around, and I said, well, not really. <laughs> he said, well, don't, don't you notice? I'm taller than you are. Okay, he had, he had wound up his chair, his desk chair, as high as it would go, and then somehow he had scrounged around the company to find the smallest chair he could find that would fit in front of a desk, right? Because he had this, he was, I, I, to be honest, I, I couldn't have told you how tall he was at that time. I hadn't paid attention. But, but he, was, he, he, he wasn't very tall, and he had this thing about being tall, and so he had fixed his office up so that anybody who walked in there, didn't matter how tall they were, were going to be shorter than he was. I thought, man, so that's what you're focused on. <laughs> I get it. And he didn't last very long. He was focused on something that he couldn't control. It was driving his existence. He put lifts in his shoes. I mean, he was doing anything he could. But you can't control how tall you are. You know, the things we can control, beloved, we ought to do what we can about those, right? Right? We can, we can do that. But the things that are out of our control, we have to leave to God. Instead of worrying about them, we have to get beyond that and say that's God's providence at work. Let his providence work. Cooperate with it. To worry about that which is beyond our control is to be in denial of God's providential care. You know, at the end of the day, we're not going to live forever and because of the effects of the fall, we are imperfect. But listen to these words from Psalm 139. Let me, let me just read them. Just listen to these. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 15. If you don't know Psalm 139, you, you need to get acquainted with it anyway. But listen to these words. Psalm 139, verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, even... In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. And if you look carefully, you'll see he's talking about the time before he was born when he was still in his mother's womb. And you knew what I was going to look like. You knew what I was going to be. You knew how many days there were going to be. It's already done. It's already written. It's already accomplished. So live in the good of the providence of God instead of fighting it with worry that somehow I need something 
different. See, what that passage in Psalm 139 is teaching is that you are perfect and I am perfect for what God wants us to accomplish in this life. Taking all the effects of the fall into account, taking all the imperfections that, 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 that work throughout the nature of our whole universe, God has created us for a purpose and then he's made us perfect for that purpose. Wow. That's striking stuff, isn't it? That's the providence of God. We are perfect for his purpose. And when we worry about that which is outside our control, we are denying his providential care and we are diminishing his value in our eyes. But at the end of the day, the one who's really diminished is us, right? Because we're wasting time that could be used to do the things that God wants us to do. We're wasting that time worrying about things that we can't change anyway. God's providence has created us to be, you know, we were watching a movie this last week that had, uh, what's that guy's name? Peter Lawford in it. And Peggy said, wow, he was really a handsome guy when he was young. And then we got thinking about what he looked like when he got older and dissipated and, you know, had lived a horribly dissolute life, and, and we were thinking, you know what? Being good-looking might have been the worst thing that ever happened to him. God's made us, beloved, to be what we need to be to accomplish his mission for us. Young people, you especially need to get that into your head. I know you think your nose is too big or your hair is too something thin or whatever, but God has made you perfect. For what he wants you to be, for what he wants you to do. You're perfect. Jesus' point is simple here. Worry never in the long history of the world changed anything. Never. Not even once. Never did. If there is something that you don't like and you can, go, you can take some action to change it, do so. We should be the best that we can be. But outside of those parameters, we are what he wants us to be. And when we are worrying about things that are outside of our control, the underlying, you know what the underlying assumption is? The underlying assumption is God screwed up here. God messed up. God didn't get it right. Sorry about that, but God didn't get it right, so I better worry about it. We diminish God by denying his providence. You know, we need to kind of get that I'm sure you've all seen it. You've probably seen it on a plaque somewhere. The serenity prayer that Reinhold Niebuhr, the theologian, came up with. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's where Jesus is going here. You know, worry does, worry assumes that God has stacked the deck against me. Doesn't it? Worry assumes that God has stacked the deck against me. If God is who he says he is, if he is involved in the way that he says he is, then worry is my mind saying, God failed me here. God stacked the deck against me. And let me tell you, when you go there, nothing good can happen. Nothing good can happen when we go there. Ask Abraham and Sarah. Look, listen, turn to Genesis 18. This is, I mean, it's a spectacular example, but it, chapter 16, I'm sorry, Genesis 16. It shows us what can be the end result when we're trying to take providence out of God's hand and put it into our own hands. You may, may remember that God had made a promise to, uh, to um, Abraham and to Sarah that he would make them a great nation and that they would have many children and that, that, that the whole world would be blessed through them. And, and, and this promise had come to them. And now here they sit, 10 years later, 10 years, long years later, Abraham's 85, his wife is 75, and there are no children. There are no children, let alone multitudes of children. And they realize that they're nearing the expiration date on making children. They're worried. And the providence of God, they're, 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 they're denying the providence of God because they've done all they can do to make children and there are no kids. But they decide, well, okay, we, we better take this into our own hands. We better do something. And here's where worry took them. 
Here's where worry took them, chapter 16 and verse 1. Now Sarah, Sarai at that time, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. As most of you know, a not uncommon practice in those days. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. So where he led to Abram taking Hagar, denying the providence of God in his own life, he got a baby boy. He loved that boy. Fifteen years on, fifteen years, 25 overall now since the promise got made, and God shows up again. And God says, by the way, Abram, next year, I'm going to have a baby. Next year, you're going to have a baby. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think he'd be rejoicing? He'd be happy? Now that you and Sarah are too old to have children, now that it's an impossibility physically for you to have children, you're going to have a baby next year. Wow. But you know what Abram said? He said, but God, I already have one. I already got one. I got one through my own fleshly effort. My worry got me a baby. I have a boy. Chapter 17, verse 18, look at it. Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. In other words, I love what I've produced. Just accept that, Lord. I don't need what you say you're going to give. Let me keep what I've already created. That's where worry gets you, beloved. But you know the story. The promise was kept. God reigns despite our idiocy, right? The baby came, but the consequences abound. Abraham's beloved son Ishmael became the cause of tremendous dissension and dysfunction within the family. Abraham finally had to send Ishmael and his mother away into the desert. And ever since, the world has teetered on the brink of disaster as the sons of Ishmael, the Arabs, and the sons of Isaac, the Israelites, fight it out. We still have the results of the worry of Abraham. We must embrace, beloved, that what we cannot change is coming from the hands of a loving heavenly Father who knows far better than we what the end results are going to be, let alone what the immediate results are going to be. We need to live lives of contentment and trust and confidence that God knows what he's doing. You know what it gives us? It gives us an opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to see God high and lifted up. And you can't get there by worrying. You can't. But when you trust him, and when you have a big God, your worries are going to be small. When you have a small God, your worries are going to be big. It's just the way it works. You can tell immediately how big God is in your mind by looking at the extent of the worry in your life. Where are you on that continuum? Chuck Swindoll, the uh, radio pastor, at a great church in Fullerton when we were living in Southern California. And at that time, he talked about a man who was in his church who had wrestled for years with giving his business over to God. He was claimed to be a Christian, but he, he, knew, he, he knew he wasn't running his business in strict accordance with the commands of God. There were certain business practices, but he was afraid to give it over. He was afraid he would lose it. He would, was afraid the business would go downhill if he really gave it to God and took his hands off and and followed according to the practices that God had ordained that you should live by, the integrity. A couple of decades he hung on to that business until God finally melted his heart through a series of circumstances in his life. And he finally came to the point where he was ready. And he, he came to his pastor one day and said, I, you know what, I'm given, I've given my business to the Lord. It's lock, stock, and barrel. I've given up. I'm tired of worrying about it. I've given it to God. Now, you would think that God would honor a decision like that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think so? 
And God did honor that decision. But he didn't honor it the way you and I would think he would honor it. Because that very night, the business caught fire. He got an emergency call, went down, got on the, out on the streets in front of his business just in time to see his factory and his warehouses all go up in smoke. One of his employees came along and noticed him standing there, calm, not nearly uptight like he was used to seeing him. He said, what's wrong with you? He said, don't you realize your, your business, your whole livelihood is going up in smoke here? The man said this. He said, yeah, I can see that. He said, but you know what? This morning I gave this company to God. It's his. If he wants to burn it up, it's his to burn. Either have a big God and little worries, or you have big worries and a little God. It's our choice, right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that, thank you, you know what I thank you for most, Lord, is that our worry or our thoughts or our, the personal limitations that we impose on you can never change who you actually are. We cannot diminish you and we can't make you any bigger than you already are. But we can certainly put limitations around you in our own life that cause us to live defeated, worried, anxious existences. Lord, help us to do two things. Number one, help us to realize worry is a sin, to confess it, part of our existence is those who came from dust and are going to dust. But it's a sin. And so help us to confess it and then Lord help us to truly give over those things that we're so concerned about, so worried about. Lord, there are many legitimate, many legitimate issues that people are worried about here this morning. Issues of money, where's the money coming from? Issues of relationships. How am I ever going to get along with this boss? Hate my work. Issues of relationships at home. Across the board. Father, help us to, try, help, help us to take our hands off the things that we somehow think we can fix and give them to you. And stop devaluing your provisions and stop denying your providence in our life, but instead embrace those. Pray that we would do that for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.